So as Derek mentioned, this morning he's to start a new series of lessons based in Hebrews chapter 11. And the title for those new lessons is that Faith in Action. And I'm hoping that the lessons don't try and define faith. This is what faith is. This is what faith means. That's not the point of the lessons, though. I'm sure some of that is essential in the background, uh, for the background in setting the tone of the lesson, so that when we look at these faithful lives, we understand more fully what that means. But my hope is that the lessons will show that faith is not a word that's, or a holy word that you read only in the Bible, but that faith as defined in the Bible, is a life-changing and a life-defining experience for those of us who believe in God, those of us who love God, those of us who seek God. In Hebrews chapter 11, the writer makes a list of such people and he calls them the ancients. That's right. Hebrews chapter 11, sometimes called the hall of faith. I've preached on that before. You've heard me say that. But the speaker goes on a journey, listing some of them and describing others. These people from down through the ages, right back to the very beginning of humanity. The very beginnings of humanity. Well, the demonstration of faith takes a journey through time and through these people. People whom the writer says were, get this, were commended. Commended by none other than God himself. You ever been somewhere college, school, uni, whatever, your job, and your boss or your teacher commend you. How good does that feel? Well, could you imagine what it would feel like to be commended by God himself? Wow. Wow. Surely as we look upon the lives of these people, and I really want you to look upon the lives of these people, and it's sad that we don't. In today's life, in today's world, we look upon the lives of football players, In movie stars, in pop stars, and singers, and authors, and politicians, and people of that ilk. To give us motivation, and inspiration, and direction. What a travesty that is. On full display here as people of faith. Of the people that we should be looking to. For inspiration, and motivation. And the things that they did for God. Oh. Things that they did for God that brought them the commendation for God. If we believe in God and we look upon their life, surely it will inspire us in no small way. To be like them, to live like them, to have a heart like them. The giants of faith. They're a part of our story. We're all in the same story. We're all going in the one direction. Truly we do stand on the shoulder. Shoulders of giants. So what's the point in this? What's the point in having faith? Well, it's verse 6 points out in chapter 11 there. It says there, without faith it is impossible to please God. If you do not have faith, you cannot please God. For those who come to worship God must believe that he really exists. And he will reward those who seek him. He can't reward us if we don't believe in him. He can't reward us if we don't seek him. And if we don't have any faith, we can't seek and there will be no reward. I pulled this out of my golf bag the other day while looking for something and I got that when I was at St Andrews. Only a handful of people in the congregation will know what that is. This is a yard book. And I got this when I played the golf at um, St Andrews. One of the outside courses, not the, the old course, you know. <laughs> no, I don't Adam's played the old course. What about you? Have you played the old course, Charlie? No? Aye, there you go. And it's a yard book. And what it does, when you open it up, it, it shows you, it points at all the hazards and how the course should be played. Not that it helps me. It tells you where the bunkers are, where the water is. It tells you the trees. It tells you where there are certain ridges. It tells you the, the run and the lay of the greens. It tells you the pin placements. It tells you everything you need to know about how to negotiate and navigate that part of the course to get your ball from the tee box and into the hole. The yard book. And professionals, this is all they use. They don't have little scopes. They don't have watches that we use. They don't use it. They have the yard book. And what happens is the guy with the club, the caddy, he goes around the day before the, the, the match, the day before the round, and he walks the entire course with the yard book, and he writes stuff in it. He paces things out. He goes before the golfer, so that when it comes to playing the shot, he can advise the golfer with a yard book. 
looking at the yard book, golfers can discover for themselves what lies ahead. What lies ahead. And you will know the club to choose and you will know the shot to play. The book here is produced from the experience of those who have gone before. Who have been over the course. Who know what it's like. Hebrews. Hebrews is a yard book which provides an excellent view or insight of what previous players have gone through. And looking at it, looking at Hebrews, we new people can discover for themselves what lies ahead and what it is that we need to equip ourselves in order to cope and to navigate and negotiate the course. The Yardbook tells you how to get through the hazards, how to deal with them, how to live, how to get the ball in the hole and to make part of better. Hebrews tells us how to navigate this course. And what we need in our bag is faith. We need faith. Faith is what we need, not to get the ball in the hole, but to get to the end game, to reach the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem and the new world. We will see that the faith of those who have gone on before us, these trailblazers, if you will, the list is long. Heroes and heroines alike. People who did things in acts of faith that when you read them, you would scarcely believe it. Prostitutes involved in it. Lying involved in it. Wow, what a story. Hebrews offers two, Hebrews 11, I should say, offers two things that go together. On the one hand, we have a description of faith itself. This is mentioned as a key asset which Christians will need. And on the other hand, a brief history of God's people. Particularly those key figures in the early periods of time. And people like giants like Moses and Abraham and those in particular. And the story doesn't end in chapter 11. It continues all the way on into chapter 12. Coming all the way forward in time to where the speaker or the, the... The writer currently is. And he says it reaches its climax in Jesus, he says in 12.3. 12.2 and 3. He says we fix our eyes in Jesus. He is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He endured the cross and endured the shame of the cross. He says consider him. Have him in the forefront of your mind. Who endured such opposition from sinners, he says. And he says the reason why I want you to do that. is So you will not grow weary. And you will not lose heart. And you will not give up. And then he urges the audience to take their place in the story along with the giants and the greats. Chapters 12, 4 to 17 gives us a description of the story. And you, sh- you should really read Hebrews 11 and 12 later by yourselves. So that, you know, this makes a bit more sense. But invites us, encourages us to live the story for ourselves. And then finally declares the goal of the journey at the very end of chapter 12 where he says, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Hebrews 11 and 12. And then he tells us what happens at the end of it all. He says his voice shakes the earth his voice shakes the heavens but that which cannot be shaken a kingdom that comes from God which cannot be shaken will remain and he says as a result of living in this kingdom this eternal kingdom let us be thankful let us worship God acceptably with reverence and awe And then he says, God is a consuming fire. So then chapters 11 and 12 go together. And to sum it up, at the very beginning of chapter 11, he talks about creation. At the very end, or towards the end of chapter 12, he gets to the culmination of it all, the new creation. And within that framework, he talks about the development of a covenant between himself and his people. And how it develops into a religion and a faith and a law. And then it goes on to become the new covenant, which we are under in Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, says the Hebrew writer. From creation to new creation, from covenant to new covenant. All through and within the story 
of faith. That's what we live out in our lives as Christians. Faith is to look to God and to say, I trust you. It's to trust him wholly with everything that we have in the way that the ancients did and we will learn how they did that. How they look to the future with their hope. And the hope and the faith are sort of tied together because their hope with faith in tow becomes assurance. <laughs> I hate the embarrassing. Their, their hope becomes assurance. So we live with God. We trust God. We hope in God. And these things are assured in God. Also wrapped up All of it, sorry, is wrapped up in faith, faith, faith in him. Not faith in you. Not faith in your pal. Not faith in the political system or a political ideology. Not faith in the education system. Not faith in the law. Not faith in your teachers. Not faith in anyone. (coughs) Faith. Faith. Not even faith in the church. But faith. Faith only. In God. If your hope (coughs) is being lived out without faith in tow or as part of the mix, the faith in the God who raised Jesus, then looking forward to the new world and the new resurrection and the new bodies that live beyond the grave is nothing more than a faint optimism. If there is no faith, Hope becomes optimism. Pointless, in other words. If you do not have faith. Assurance and conviction in the lives of these people is strikingly evident as you go through chapter 11. And that's what we're going to look at in the next few weeks. This, this lesson is like, it serves two masters. We know what the Bible says about that. As a fact, I just looked at my watch and a... Uh, I got a wee alert that says, no one can serve two masters, either you will hate one or love the other. <laughs> but the, the lesson tries to serve two masters as introductory material to the series and something about the first character. So let's bring characters on the stage, starting with Abel. Are you watching? Are you comfortable? You got your popcorn at the ready? Watch this. Verse 4. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. And this is a story that Mark read. By faith, he was commended By faith he was commended as righteous. That's nice. I love that. When God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith Abel still speaks even though. Even though he's dead. So the story of faith goes almost the way back to the very beginning of the human family. In fact we're only four people in. We don't have any Adam and Eve in Hebrews chapter 11. Why is that? Oh, because they don't need faith. They walked in the garden with God, for pity's sake. And and I think it describes it in the cool of the evening or something like that. Imagine that experience. Walking with God. Wow. Still they messed up. (laughs) And Cain and Abel appear to be the first two babies in the world then. The first two offspring. We read that Adam and Eve gave birth to a boy called Cain and later came his brother Abel. Some commentators say they were twins. I see absolutely nothing in the scriptures to suggest that. Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. And it says there, I don't know what, quite what it says in Mark's um, translation, but it says there that in the course of time they brought sacrifices to God. In the course of time. Cain brought his sacrifice or his offering, which was probably some vegetables, right? It says that he brought from, his, from the fruit of the land, vegetables. And Cain, uh, sorry, Abel then, the farmer, brought something from his flock, a choice animal as an offering. Interesting words, the end of days, or the course of time rather, is translated literally the end of days. Well, the end of what days? That sounds a bit dramatic. The end of days? What do you think that means? The end of the working days. At the end of the week, in other words. This is a precursor of the Sabbath. Remember, we're only five minutes out of the garden. God had made everything in six days and on the seventh day he rested. He gave that as a work week pattern for the Jews. The seventh day would be the Sabbath where they wouldn't work. And so they came at the end of the days, the six days, made their offering. This was their act of worship, a precursor to the Sabbath. We read that God, or we heard that God looked favourably upon Abel's offering, while Cain's offering was, well, that was just flung out, really. 
God told, told him as much and says he wasn't happy with him. And what was Cain's reaction to this? To repent and say, okay, I'll go and bring you a better offer and get himself back in line? No. He was angry. He was angry and the scriptures tells us that his face was downcast. And in the Hebrew it literally means he, he changed his face. So he went from to... So he just pulled a horrible face because of disappointment. Cain's anger was left unrepentant and it festered and his jealousy brought rage and he killed his brother. Isn't that brutal? You're four people into the world and you've already killed one of them. Quarter of the population dead because of selfishness. And this act in the passage is well known and it's well known for all the wrong reasons. People who have never picked up a Bible know who Cain and Abel are. They are the poster boys for family feuds. They are the poster boys for sibling rivalry. And of course, that's a travesty. Because that's not what the passage is preserved for. That's not the point of it. This is the view. Or this view, rather, is the trees that prevent the sight of the wood. These are events. These events were not recorded for that purpose. The real purpose here is all about faithfully giving to God. Giving God his due. Trusting wholly in him. So why was one offering accepted and yet the other wasn't? And I listened for hours actually on YouTube to people preaching on this. And they all say it's pretty much the same thing. If you're going to make a sacrifice for sin, it has to be a blood sacrifice. The scriptures teach this, of course, in the Mosaic law, as it developed that the priest or the high priest would take in a blood sacrifice to sprinkle the mercy seat for the forgiveness of the people's sins. And later on, Christ superseded all of that with the forgiveness of sins for the world with the blood of himself. I suppose that makes sense, to take that story that and then bring it back to Genesis. Only, the problem with that is that the passage doesn't even suggest that at all. This is inferred from events in the future. It doesn't mention anything about sacrificing. And it doesn't mention anything about sin. Read it again. Quite clearly the the brothers it says are made in. And it uses the word offering. I read 30 translations. I heard Mark says last week. 30 translations I looked at. Or actually more. And the internet is wonderful. I don't have 30 different Bibles. 30 translations. And one of them. Only once used the word sacrifice. 27 or so used the word sacrifice offering which we have today and one or two says gift or present I think yours says gift isn't it aye and it comes from the Hebrew word I was going to drop it there I forgot it minkal it's pronounced minka, which means tribute gift or offering nothing about a sacrifice in the meaning of the word itself they were making an offering that's all they were making an offering and this offering why were they making it at the end of days in the precursor to the Sabbath well it's obvious it seems to me that this was their act of Worship. This is their act of worship. So why was God pleased with one offering, one act of worship, yet he wasn't so pleased with the other one? For me, it seems pretty straightforward. And you've heard this phrase, sorry, this phrase many, many, many times. It's a matter of the heart, isn't it? It's where the heart lies that defines your worship and defines your relationship with God. It's all about the heart. The heart has to be in it. And it appears to me that Cain's offering or act of worship was not accepted because his heart wasn't in it. He was chucking God leftovers. Stuff that wasn't really that used to him. He just grabbed it together at the last minute and says, Well, that'll do. Here you go, God. And flings it down. His offering costs, his offering costs him next to nothing that he gives to God. His worship is slap dash. His offering reflected what he thought of God. Perhaps what he even thought about himself. You don't, give some, you don't give generously to something you don't care about, do you? No, sometimes we just give a token gesture to this. When the, look, when the worksheet comes round, right, it's somebody's buffy like, oh, more money, more money. So you do that, I'll stick a pound or two quid in there, a token gesture, because you don't really care about it, right? I mean, I don't see, yeah, I've said stuff I shouldn't have said there, but it's not on your heart, your heart's not in saying, oh, there you go, there's we shuggy down in the print room there, and there's 50 quid. That's not going to harm Token gesture is what Cain gave. A token gesture. Why? Because his heart wasn't in it. Abel's offer, on the other hand, is in stark contrast to his brothers. He took the very best of his flock and gave it to God, which, of course, reflected the, the condition of his heart and how he felt about God and how he viewed God and his, 
His offering was a bold statement of faith and worship. You don't just giving up stuff for value if you don't think it's worth it, do you? You don't know who Shuggy from the print room is. You've never met him. You're hardly going to stick in half your wage, are you? Of course not. Lost my place. Yeah, you don't just give up stuff of value if you think it's not worth it. He clearly thinks then that God is worth it. And why has he come to this conclusion? Why does he live like this? Why does he think like this? Because this is where his faith, his experience of a relationship with God, however that plays out, I don't know. But this is where it's led him. This is where his faith has led him and taken him. And this is the difference, it seems to me, between the two. Cain was half-hearted offering, while Abel's offering was a sacrifice. Now, I don't mean a literal sacrifice that he went up because he made a sacrifice, although he probably did if it was an animal. He's probably slain the animal and laid it on some sort of altar of some sort, right? Probably. But what I mean when I say sacrifice, I mean a sacrifice to himself, because this is something of value that he's taken, something that costs him something. And he says, I'll give that to God. He's made a self-sacrifice, whereas Cain couldn't care less. His worship was sacrificial. <clears throat> what comes to mind when you think about that? <clears throat> Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. This is what comes to mind when we think about faith as an act of worship. Therefore, Paul writes, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of what God has done for you, offer your bodies yourselves, your lives, as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing to God, not slapdash. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the image of the world, he says, or the pattern of the world. And there are three things there you can see with the arrows. Three things worth noting. First of all, he says that our offering, in this case our bodies or our lives, the way that we live, should be sacrificial. Coming to God in your life should be sacrificial if you want to worship. If your faith is like that of Abel's or the giants of faith, it should be sacrificial. Secondly, he says, this is proper worship. There is no other way to worship. And thirdly, he says, if we fail to do that, if we just go about it slap dash and back, well, we'll just go to church today. Well, oh, it's Sunday, so I guess we better make a show or whatever. He says, this is conforming to the pattern of the world. Conforming to the pattern of the world in the context of worship is simply to deny God his place in our lives. <coughs> to deny God the rightful place in our lives. Where do we see that? Well, you saw it in Cain, didn't you? That's conforming to the pattern of the world. The Cains of this world, oh, they don't really need to worship God. They might just, you know... Like the, the rich young, no, wasn't it? Was it the rich young ruler? God, what must I do to be saved? Was it him? Aye. You know, he was all hubris. What do I need to do? I've got all that. I've got this cover, God. You know, I'm just asking this for a joke here. I'm just making fun. I'm just doing this for the sake of it. The kings of the world, hubris and arrogance, self importance, self made men, prideful. Cain came to God with an, off, with an offering holding his head in the air. Look at me. Self-righteous. Sturdy as a rock. Immovable in his own self. I wonder what Jesus would say about people who are confident in their own righteousness and look down on everyone else. Well he did say something about that funnily enough in Luke chapter 18 verses 9 and 12. Or 9 and 14. Here's the first part. He says, to those who are confident in their own self-righteousness and look down on everyone else, he says, or Jesus told this parable. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, evildoers and robbers and adulterers, and even like him over there, that tax collector guy. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of everything I have. That's Cain. That's Cain's view. That's the Cain focus and worship. Conversely, the Abels are spiritual, humble, Cain, uh, sorry, Abel realises he needs God. He knows that without God there is nothing. He knows that without God there is no direction. He knows that without God there is nowhere to go. There is no end game. 
Abel comes to God with his head in his hands, buried in humility. He has the attitude of the tax collector in the story that Jesus told. He says, but the tax collector, he wouldn't come all the way in. He just stood at a distance in his humility. He didn't even look up to heaven. But he bowed his head and looked down and beat his breast and says, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the Pharisee, the one with all the stuff going on, rather than him, was more justified before God. One man's worship was pleasing, the other was not. As the tax collector in the story drew commendation from God for his spirit of humility and self-awareness, that's what happens with Abel. His faith conditioned him to be humble and to look to God, to follow God, to give God his place, to offer himself as a living sacrifice. He knew God. He must have. He must have had some sort of deep relationship with him to be, able, to be able to put God forward and first in this way, unlike Cain, who didn't. This was a result of an active faith. This is the life of sacrificial worship. We look down at the yard book and see what lies ahead. And we see Abel living a life of self-sacrifice. His life and his death calls us to be like him in every way. To do what he did. To be thankful to God. A God who's filled with grace and mercy. A God who accepts the unacceptable. A God who makes a way when there is no way. And a God who brings all of it to a glorious conclusion. As the Hebrew writer says, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reference with reverence and awe.